You know, serendipity is a wonderful thing when you think about it. If I told you about a low-budget horror movie from the 1970s about three guys in a boat fighting a rubber shark that kept breaking down and sinking, portrayed by a motley crew of dysfunctional actors that regularly fell out on set, and helmed by an inexperienced young director whose lack of understanding of the difficulties of shooting at sea caused the production to drag on for nearly six months, you'd probably assume I was about to launch into a scathing tirade against another piece of cinematic excrement for your viewing pleasure. You certainly wouldn't be expecting another instalment of THE DRINKER RECOMMENDS. But that's exactly what you're getting, because the other day I happened to be idly flicking through the channels in search of something that didn't make me want to shove an ice pick through my brain. And wouldn't you know it, Jaws was just starting. Now, like most of you, I've seen this movie a bunch of times in my life, but it's been many years since I watched it all the way through, and to be honest, I'd kind of forgotten half of it. I certainly didn't remember it as being particularly special, just one of those old classics that people view through very forgiving rose-tinted glasses. But what the hell, I thought to myself, maybe I'll watch half an hour to kill some time until that pint of rum kicks in and I can slip into an alcohol-induced stupor for the rest of the night. Anyway, two hours later the credits rolled and I sat back on my couch completely captivated by what I'd just seen. Jaws is a movie that gripped me from the chilling opening scene and didn't let go until the explosive finale, employing a perfectly judged combination of suspense, action, tension, foreboding, levity, memorable characters, and an iconic musical score to weave a spell that's just as potent now as it was 45 years ago. And I knew right away, I just had to talk about the movie that once made everyone afraid to go in the water, and try to understand just what it is that makes Jaws so special. So let's begin our journey, shall we? Here's to swimming with bow-legged women. Jaws is set in the fictional New England vacation town of Amity around the 4th of July weekend. The action kicks off with a young woman who goes skinny dipping in the middle of the night and in one of those iconic scenes in cinema gets attacked and killed by an unidentified creature. When her remains wash up on the beach the next day, the newly appointed chief of police Martin Brody is brought in to investigate. He suspects a shark attack and he wants to close the town's beaches until it can be dealt with. But the local mayor is like, nah, it'll be fine, because he doesn't want to start a panic that'll drive much needed tourists away from his town. Nice suit, by the way. Brody's not convinced by this, but he allows himself to be persuaded into keeping it quiet. Pretty quickly, you realise this man isn't your conventional strong-willed hero that does things his own way, consequences be damned. He's a city cop in a close-knit island community, and he doesn't have the self-confidence or the authority to stand up to pressure from the mayor. As a result, he backs down and capitulates against his better judgments. Needless to say, this turns out to be a bad call, and pretty soon, another fatal attack happens in the middle of a crowded beach. You know, there's something really sinister and disturbing about this scene. The fact that it happens in broad daylight with hundreds of people around. That someone can just vanish right in front of your eyes in a matter of seconds. And it's helped by some brilliant cinematography. Remember that weird reverse zoom effect that you've seen in a million different movies? Well, Alfred Hitchcock might have invented it for his movie Vertigo, but Steven Spielberg made it truly iconic in this scene. Anyway, with the body count rising, Brody calls in marine biologist Matt Hooper to help him figure out what they're dealing with. Hooper's a pretty unassuming guy that most people take no notice of, but he knows his stuff when it comes to underwater predators. When local fishermen manage to kill a tiger shark and the mayor convinces everyone the crisis is over, he's the first to suggest they might be wrong. Needless to say, the others don't listen to him and, well, guess what happens? <laughs> With multiple people dead and Brody's own son traumatised by the latest attack, he's determined to hunt down and kill the shark responsible. But he can't do it alone. Enter Quint, professional shark hunter and part-time shanty singer. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Received orders 
to sail back to Boston. I had a little drink about an hour ago. I just got right to my head. And so never more shall we see you again. I'll talk more about this guy later, but suffice to say, the dude's a fucking legend, and he gets some of the best lines of the entire movie. What are you, some kind of half-ass astronaut? Hey, Hooper! Maybe a big yahoo in the lab, but out here it gets supercargo. If you don't want a backstroke home, you get down here! Case goes in the water, you go in the water, sharks in the water. Well, it proves one thing, Mr. Hooper. It proves that you wealthy college boys don't have the education enough to admit when you're wrong. Anyway, he agrees to kill the shark for a hefty fee and reluctantly allows the two men to accompany him on his boat, the Orca. Together, they head out to sea with a simple mission, find the shark and kill the shit out of it. This is where the movie switches gears into a kind of cat and mouse game between the three men and the monster they're hunting. They start out in high spirits, as well they should. They've got a shark expert on board, an experienced hunter and a boat full of weapons and equipment. And at first, the expedition has the feel of a routine fishing trip. The music's upbeat, the three of them are swapping banter, and they've even got cans of beer on hand. But after their first encounter with the shark, the tone darkens quickly as it becomes clear they're facing something more dangerous than any of them expected. Something that may just be hunting them instead. As the shark comes after them again and again, everything they throw at it fails to stop it. Their resources become depleted, their boat gets damaged, and tempers start to fray as their situation becomes increasingly bleak. It's wearing them down, just like a predator stalking its prey. Little by little, every layer of protection gets stripped away until they find themselves locked in a desperate battle for survival. A battle that only one side is going to get away from. I said before that serendipity played a big part in the success of this film, because everything that should have worked against it somehow ended up making it better. The mechanical shark that they used during production kept breaking down and sinking, forcing Steven Spielberg to use it sparingly, shooting a lot of the attack scenes from the shark's point of view instead. Most of the time you don't even get to see the thing, it's just a dark, ominous shape gliding beneath the surface, or a fin slicing through the water, or the flotation barrels that they harpoon into it in a futile attempt to keep it on the surface. I'm a big fan of creeping terror in movies like this, the idea of something horrific slowly closing in on you as you fumble to escape or perform some task that should be easy but suddenly becomes a desperate struggle as panic takes hold. It's a brilliant way of building the tension and suspense, and of course, it's helped by that absolutely perfect soundtrack. You don't need to actually see the shark to know that it's out there, that it's coming for you, and it's the moments when it's not visible that the tension reaches its peak. It all ties into the classic horror trope that what we fear most is the unknown. When people describe being afraid of the dark or of swimming in the ocean, it's not the absence of light or the presence of deep water that frightens them, it's the possibility of what might be lurking in that darkness or just beneath the surface. When we're presented with a threat but not shown what exactly it is, our imaginations concoct all kinds of nameless terrors that are far more horrifying than anything some props department could create. Which brings me along to one of my few criticisms. Yeah, saying the shark in Jaws looks fake is about as obvious as saying that water is wet or The Last Jedi sucks, but it would be remiss of me not to at least acknowledge it. So yeah, on the rare occasions when the shark does make a full appearance, it's very obvious that it's just a big rubber prop, and it does steal some of the thunder from what should be a pretty horrific scene otherwise. So consider my criticism delivered, I guess. Dodgy special effects aside, one of the things that really impressed me about Jaws is how it manages to switch effortlessly between emotional tones and even entire genres, sometimes in the space of a single scene. Like here, where we go from a light-hearted character moment of two men drunkenly comparing scars and funny stories, to a chilling recollection of a real World War II tragedy, and finally to a tense action scene where their boat gets attacked and damaged in the middle of the night. 
all in the space of like five minutes. And it never feels jarring or awkward. It's a brilliant example of what happens when writing, direction and performances gel perfectly to create a seamless end product. On the one hand, Jaws is a monster movie about a giant shark rising out of the depths and attacking unsuspecting victims. On the other, it's an action-adventure film with shooting, explosions, boats getting sunk and cages getting torn open. And at other times, it's a buddy movie about three misfits having to work together to overcome a dangerous challenge. And this is where Jaws really shines for me. See, a lot of people like to say the shark itself is the star of the movie because its presence looms over everything like a giant shadow. But the three leads are what make it such a compelling story. They feel like real, believable people with actual personalities and backstories that logically inform their behaviour and little nuances and quirks that help to humanise them. Quint is very much the alpha male of the group. He's belligerent and domineering, especially towards Hooper, who he sees as a spoiled rich kid. You got city hands, Mr. Hooper. Been counting money all your life. All right, all right, all right. Hey, I don't need this. I don't need this working class hero crap. And the two men quickly get into a pissing contest that lasts for the rest of the film, whether it's crushing drinks receptacles, comparing old scars in a scene that's been copied so many times it's basically a parody at this point, or even arguing about how hard to push the boat's damaged engines. I love this scene where he tests Hooper by making him tie a complex sailing knot and then doesn't even bother to check the results. It tells you everything you need to know about the level of respect that Quint has for him. But despite his aggressive persona, there's a more human side to him that he shows from time to time. He demonstrates genuine concern for their safety by warning them when they're hurt or in danger. And he's relatively forgiven towards Brody, who clearly doesn't know his way around a boat and therefore presents no threat to his authority. At one point, he even opens up about his past experiences with sharks, delivering what has to be one of the most chilling and compelling monologues that I've ever heard. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white and then... Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. You just can't take your eyes off the guy when he's speaking. And what makes it even more awesome is that Robert Shaw was actually drunk when he delivered it. What a fucking legend. Hooper, on the other hand, is a smart and educated man from a wealthy family who went to some expensive Ivy League university. He's young and enthusiastic and clearly passionate about what he does, and the natural assumption would be that he's some clueless bookworm who doesn't have a hint of real-world experience. But he quickly proves himself to be a competent and effective sailor, a skilled mechanic, and a brave man willing to put himself in harm's way for the others. All of these things help to make him an effective foil for Quint, whose knowledge is based entirely on experience rather than education, and it results in very different motivations and objectives for the two men. Quint gradually becomes fixated on killing the shark as his mission devolves into a personal grudge, taking increasingly big risks that ultimately seal his fate, while Hooper is more interested in studying and understanding the animal. He recognises the need to kill it, but he's more cautious and pragmatic about it, and this difference in approach often brings the two men into conflict. Violin, Stingray, been through this piano air. Don't you tell me my business again. As a little side note, Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfus legit hated each other for most of the shoot and even came close to fighting a few times, which did wonders for the antagonism between their two characters. Another little piece of serendipity that somehow worked in the film's favour. Take note of this, Island of Dr. Moreau. Brody is kind of a bridge between the two men, the everyman character that has no real stake in this but got dragged into it because he made a promise to see it through. He's basically the voice of the audience here, questioning in the other character's decisions and helping us to understand what the shark's doing. He doesn't know his way around the boat and relies on the others to keep him from injuring himself. He's scared of water, even more scared of the shark, and mostly just wants to get the fuck out of there. Exactly how we would feel. But as his crewmates are killed off or incapacitated, he's forced to rise to the occasion and overcome his fears to deliver the killing blow. It's a perfect little character arc, really. 
The point here is that we're given a trio of characters that are smarter, more nuanced and complex than they have any right to be. Characters that look, act and behave like real people with multifaceted personalities. And watching them interact with each other makes me kind of nostalgic for a time when screenwriters actually bothered to write films for people with a mental age in double digits. Not to mention when actors didn't look like they rolled off a fucking assembly line. God only knows what these three would be like if Jaws were ever remade. Brody would be an invincible muscle-bound superman that fires a grenade launcher into the shark's mouth. Hooper would be a comically inept bookworm that trips over his own feet. And Quint would probably be played by Tandy Newton. You were both a bit late. So I went ahead and saved myself. Fuck off, Tandy Newton. Ultimately, Jaws is an absolutely classic movie, belonging to a very different time in cinema. A time when writing could still be sharp and characters gritty and authentic. When suspense and slowly building tension were more effective than CGI explosions and lens flare. And when a simple premise done extremely well was enough to craft a compelling and thrilling narrative. It's a time in movie making that I can't help but miss. A time that I really wish modern filmmakers would actually work to understand and develop, instead of blatantly ripping off to try to recapture lost magic. So if you haven't ventured into the waters off Amity Island in a long time, I suggest you dust your copy of Jaws off and give it another watch for old times sake, because the drinker recommends it. You'll probably be surprised by just how good it is. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Go away now.